All right, welcome everyone. My name is Valentina and I am joined today by Vern Stierner, who is the president of the Emmaus Institute. And for those who don't know what the Emmaus Institute is, don't worry, we'll talk a lot about it today. But primarily today, we're going to talk about scripture, the word of God. And I have my Bible right here and specifically about the relevance it has on our lives today. So for many of you listening, you may be either at a job that you don't like, or you at a job, you're at a job that you do love, or maybe you're going through a difficult family situation, or you might be feeling lost and you're wondering where to turn and what to do. Well, the beautiful thing is that God never leaves us. He never has abandoned us and he has gifted us his words that we can always read to be renewed. So my hope, Burns' hope, is that by the end of this session or this time together, that you'll leave with a renewed understanding of God's intimate love for you and how he desires to renew you each and every day through the power of his words. So get excited to learn and to grab your Bible if you have it with you. So let's begin, Vern. Um, can you please share with us what the Emmaus Institute is? What led you to start it, and what is your role there? Certainly. Thank you so much. Our full name is the Emmaus Institute for Biblical Studies, and we're in our third year of existence. Uh, we're focused on scripture study so that God's people can grow in their love for Christ through a deepening understanding of his holy word uh, and its centrality in, in the life and liturgy of God's people. Uh, I serve uh, as the president, the director of this institute. We're small, just a staff of four. And, uh, and the history is interesting. And my family and I entered the Catholic Church just a few years ago. Uh, our son and his family in 2011, and then my wife and I and our daughter and her family in 2015. And uh, just a couple of months after uh, entering the church, Bishop Connolly called and asked if I would be willing to begin uh, a conversation with him, uh, beginning with prayer, of course, and seeking the Lord's will with a view to establishing an institute uh, one day here in the Diocese of Lincoln that is devoted to the study of sacred scripture. Uh, my background is in the study and teaching of scripture in the Protestant world in various capacities as a pastor and then as a seminary professor. Mm -hmm. And knowing of that background, uh, he thought I might be the person. Well, I wasn't so sure. And uh, oh. it took me about four years. I felt like I was such a baby Catholic and I just needed to learn and grow. Uh, but four years later, in the fall of 2019, we opened our doors. We offer mm -hmm. courses and seminars, consulting, uh, a website, uh, various uh, speaking uh, uh, venues, and, and uh, we're having a wonderful time. God is blessing in, in glorious ways, and uh, it's, it's humbling uh, and gratifying to be part of this institute. Oh, well, I'm so glad. I'm, I'm so glad that you're here in the Lincoln Diocese doing such good work, and uh, I haven't yet attended any of the classes, but I know several people who have, and they have all raved about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm hoping to attend some of the classes in the future. I hope that works out. Yeah, and just to just to know, do you have classes online that people could access? We do. We have a, a growing number of classes online. Not all of our classes are offered in that in that way, but some of them are, and okay. we're trying to expand those offerings. Okay. Okay. Um, and so you had mentioned that you've been a, a, a student of scripture for about 40 years and in various capacities of, of preaching and being a seminary professor, but who first introduced you to the scriptures and inspired your love of it? I, I was so blessed to grow up in a Christian home with parents who love the Lord and love the scriptures. So I would I would say it goes all the way back to my childhood. Mm -hmm. And then of course through the years I, I attended a Christian college with some wonderful instructors uh, who who continued to uh, nurture that love and then on into graduate school uh, where it grew and deepened. And uh, eventually then as I mentioned a moment ago, I, I pastored a Protestant church for a number of years. 
it was one of these situations where I was privileged to to study about 35 hours a week. So it was wow. <laughs> And my love for scripture just continued to grow and develop and um, blossom. And, yeah. and then from there, I, I went back to school, went to Chicago and did my PhD work in, in what we call exegetical theology, where we okay. work in the original languages of scripture. So oh. I, I'm a, an avid reader of Hebrew and Greek scripture. And, oh, wow. And uh, that's, that's not to impress anyone. It's simply the path God led me to walk. And yeah. um, so my love for scripture began in childhood and it grows to this day. And, and yeah. I like to tell people that even at age 71, I'm still growing in my love <laughs> for scripture. And of course, yeah. for the Lord who speaks to us there. Yeah. I've been influenced by many scholars, I should mention as well. Okay. So uh, you see surrounding me here a library and... These are my friends. These are my mentors. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, having come into the Catholic Church uh, uh, six years, seven years ago, uh, you know, learning through uh, the church documents, uh, such as Dei Verbum, one of the Vatican mm -hmm. II documents, I'm just madly in love with that uh, wonderful piece, uh, and uh, various papal documents, uh, the church has always called us to listen to the scriptures. We mm -hmm. do that at mass. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, my, my love continues to grow. Yeah. So did you know that you would be where you are now? Like when you were a little, little Vern, <laughs> like, <laughs> what did little. You, <laughs> <laughs> like, what did you want to be when you grew up? And if someone had said that you would be the president of a an institute about the scriptures, like, would you have believed them? <laughs> no, I I was a shy fella growing up in Aww. a small Ohio town, northeastern Ohio town, not not too far from Akron. Okay. Um, a small uh, rural community, and I never had aspirations of public life. I, okay. Uh, I I have interests in electrical and mechanical areas i love oh. to work with my hands okay uh i have a little um hobby of woodworking so i i, oh, I love yeah. that those sorts of things but the lord has called and tugged and <laughs> thrust me into positions that i never imagined i would have so public speaking began in high school actually <laughs> and okay Continued on through college, I was invited to have a traveling uh, ministry for the Christian college I attended, mm -hmm. and then on into uh, graduate school, and eventually I uh, became a, a teacher in that same school, and, and then on into the pastorate, and yeah. on into seminary teaching. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I've started two biblical studies institutes now, one oh. in the Protestant world, which, which okay. ended in 2013, and then okay. now Emmaus Institute. And I, I take none of the credit. It's, it's yeah. all the Lord's calling, yeah. and uh, I'm humbled by it. Uh, it's just been an incredible privilege. Oh. It's a testament to just following the promptings of our Lord, it and is. how he leads us on an adventure exactly. in ways that we just never can imagine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I so you and I met uh, probably about a week ago. <laughs> Full disclosure to everyone here. We're new I had a, yes. And so I had attended a talk that you gave with someone else at your institute about how to incorporate the reading of scripture in our daily lives. And you shared there your your daily routine of reading um, from the Old Testament and then from the New Testament and using that to pray for others. Can you share with us a little bit more about your routine and, and just specifically on using the scriptures to pray for the situations and the people in our lives? Sure, sure. I don't know how I came on this idea, but um, probably 45 years ago or so, I began a daily discipline of reading a portion of an Old Testament book progressively. So beginning in chapter one of a given Old Testament book. Mm -hmm. uh, and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of every week, I read a portion. Sometimes it's just a paragraph or two. Sometimes it's a longer section. 
And then uh, likewise on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday mornings, a New Testament book. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned a moment ago, I, I'm a lover of uh, biblical languages, so I do all my reading in Hebrew and Greek. I, I oh. rarely read an English Bible. Okay. Um, huh. and, uh, and what's happened over the years is that reading for a given morning has, has shaped, uh, uh, influenced my prayer life that, that follows. So I have... Uh, uh, an organized prayer approach. I, I use three by five cards and uh, the, the top card it would be a list of things for which I pray daily. Uh, family members, for example, uh, I, I pray for 12 or 15 priests I've gotten to know personally. Mm. I, I pray for um, many situations in, in our world and, and in my particular circle. Uh, my work that day and uh, those with whom I'll be working and any speaking engagements, teaching, and so on. These are daily prayer requests. And I let the readings of that morning uh, influence um, how I pray for those mm -hmm. people and those, um, those concerns. Uh, then I have the second card would be that particular day of the week. So a card for Monday, a card for Tuesday, and so on. Okay. And uh, so these are the people and the matters for which I pray weekly. And again, uh, I always try to let the reading, whether it be from the Old Testament book or the New Testament book, I, I let those readings um, speak mm -hmm. into my prayer. So recently I have been reading in some of the Old Testament prophets uh, mm -hmm. just yesterday. Uh, or let's see, this is there's, this is Wednesday. Yes. <laughs> yes. Monday, I was reading a portion of, of the prophet Amos, and uh, and I let that reading then influence um, how inform how I pray for the various items in my prayer mm -hmm. plan for that day. Um, so it, it's been a wonderful uh, experience for me. Um, so my, my pace is slow as I read the scriptures. Sometimes I'll spend a, a, an entire year just in one book. Mm -hmm. and, and again, other times it, it, it speeds up, moves along more quickly, and I spend less time in that book. And of course, books vary in terms of their length. Yeah, But that's been my approach for these many, many years. Uh, yeah. I've tried to add into that some of our Catholic prayers. Um, my prayer life out of my Protestant world, of course, is a more uh, extemporaneous, a spontaneous mm -hmm. kind of praying. Mm -hmm. But the church is rich with the prayer tradition. And so yeah. I try to incorporate some of those into my prayer life as well. Uh, yeah. I'm also um, very fond of St. John Henry Newman. Oh, okay. He's my patron. Really? And, uh, and I have a collection of his prayers, and I've memorized oh. uh, some of those prayers. And uh, so that, that also informs how I pray. Okay. But, but back to the, to the original point here, scripture has been a guide. So um, uh, we can do that from any part of scripture, uh, it, not just the prayers, like the prayers of Jesus or the prayers of St. Paul. But any part of scripture can inform how we pray. And it keeps yeah. prayer fresh and alive. There's nothing wrong with routine prayers, but I like to let the scripture of the day inform mm -hmm. how I pray. Yeah. No, I, I really, really like that. And it's it's similar in a sense to how I pray. I So last year, I just focused on the book of Luke. Mm -hmm. And each day I'd read a little bit of it and and just chew on the words and and have sure. those words inspire me. Um, and I will try to remember them throughout the day. And sure. um, but one thing I that would just really struck with me, stuck with me from what you shared was just using that to pray specifically for people. And so I, I put it into practice this past weekend. I was praying for someone near and dear to me and using Psalm 23. And um, there's a particular verse there that says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And so in praying for this particular individual, I, I replaced me with them. And I said, um, goodness and mercy shall follow him 
it was yes. all the days of his life. And so whenever I'd want to get anxious about this particular situation, I would just repeat that line over yeah. and over, just praying that over him. <laughs> oh, so and good. That it was personalizes. Just really... mm -hmm. Yes, that personalizes scripture. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, but yeah, that, thank you for sharing that. And I also remember in the talk last week, you shared about how the Shema is so critical for understanding God's heart for scripture and how it should be a part of our daily lives. Can you explain what the Shema is and, and why you said that it was critical? Sure, sure. Well, the Hebrew word at the beginning of Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, is properly pronounced Shema. Shema, and, okay. Yeah, Shema, and you will hear this uh, if you have Jewish friends. It's it's really the the, the most uh, important confession in Judaism to mm. this day, and has been through the centuries. I have just uh, above me to my left here a very large volume, about a thousand pages or so, mm -hmm. entitled the Mishnah. It's a collection of Jewish uh, teachings that begins with uh, about four or five pages of detailed instructions on how the Jews are supposed to recite the Shema daily. Oh, And uh, this follows right on into Jesus' teaching. We're all familiar with what Jesus called the greatest or first and greatest commandment. You shall mm -hmm. love the Lord your God mm -hmm. with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. Mm -hmm. This comes directly from the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and following, hear, O Israel, that's the word Shema, hear, listen. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I try to emphasize to God's people that we are, first of all, listeners. Yeah. Before we even know we are to love God and serve God and, and all the others, mm -hmm. uh, we must listen. We must hear what God has to say. So Israel is being called here to listen. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So there is the beginning of the Shema. Listen, uh, uh, confess that there is one Lord mm -hmm. and love him with all you are. What follows then is, is so interesting how do we live out this love? Verse 6, and these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. So when we love God, we want mm -hmm. to take his word to our heart. We mm -hmm. want to uh, ingest it, as it were. And it continues. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise. So loving God doesn't stop with our own heart. It passes mm -hmm. on to the next generation. If yeah. we love God with all we are, we're going to want to pass that on to our children. And it continues. And you shall bind them, that is the words of God, as a sign upon your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. The emphasis here being, of course, that you shall... Uh, abide by them uh, continually, uh, having them bound upon your hand and as frontlets between your eyes, never forgetting the sacred words, the words of our God. And one more verse, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The point being, not only does love of God manifest itself in taking God's word to our own hearts and passing them on to our children, and doing so continually, but it also becomes public. It becomes that by which we're known. We, we post God's word, as it were, on the gates uh, and the door frames of our homes so that there's no mistaking. This is where God lives. This is where God is loved. This is where God is served. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I, now married 50 years, have oh, had this congratulations. imaginary, thank you, this imaginary sign over our front door. It, so if you come to our home, you won't see it there, but, but, it's, it, but it's there. Uh, may all who enter here know that this is where God dwells. Mm. And, um, and, and we try to live true to that by taking God's word to heart, 
loving God with all our heart and passing that on to our children and our neighbors and friends. Mm -hmm. So Deuteronomy 6 is a guiding passage in Judaism. And clearly from the Gospels, it is a guiding passage for our Lord Jesus as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, becomes one of those just uh, exceptionally, I think, uh, instructive passages for God's people. Yeah. Oh, thank you for breaking that down. And I I really like how it starts with listen, like hero, list, oh, hero yeah. Israel, and like listen. And I, I think for me, oftentimes when I pray, I tend to just rattle things off to God. <laughs> <laughs> All of my like requests and, sure. <laughs> and just actually listen and uh, listening. Like, do you have any r advice on how to just listen better as we pray? as we enter prayer? Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 think, I think we all know that one of the best ways to communicate our love for one another is to listen, mm. to, to be quiet, to, to reserve judgment, to be patient in, 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 and measured in, in our responses, which requires listening. Mm -hmm. uh, books like Proverbs and Sirach mm -hmm. uh, are very strong on this. If we're going to speak properly, we must first learn to listen well. Yeah. It, it's a communicating of our love. It's a manifestation of our love for one another in our mm -hmm. homes and our other relationships. If we just transfer that concept to our relationship with our Lord, listening becomes one of the primary ways to, to, to express our love for our Lord. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and patience is implicit in listening. I, I think in our world, in our culture today, uh, we're in such a hurry. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, and we receive so much, um, uh, May, so, you know, so much mail and, 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 uh, and other sources of, of information that we just learn to speed read and discard. <laughs> and sometimes when it comes to scripture, we fall into that trap and we just speed through a paragraph or, or a chapter. And, and my encouragement would be for us just to slow down, to be patient, mm -hmm. to, uh, to listen, because it, it's an act of love and uh and not to tell god as it were hurry up because i have other <laughs> important things to do <laughs> but the yeah. most important thing right now is for me to be a listener yeah and you're absolutely right like just even thinking in my own life when the people around me take the time to listen to me like not even offer advice but just to listen Yes. I feel so loved and that's yes. truly all I needed from them in the first place was just to sure. see me and to sure. just to listen to me so yeah. if, if that impacts me on such a small scale like just imagining what that how God feels when I I actually listen to him exactly. <laughs> or take the time exactly yeah. yeah and then I think we pray better too you know having oh. listened to the Lord yeah. our hearts are fuller uh, mm. of of what it is we should be praying hmm. um, so it, it becomes this this two-way communication we're listening to to what god has to say and we're speaking the things that are pressing on our hearts and hmm. to me that's that's the building of an intimate relationship with our lord yeah hmm. thank you for sharing that yeah. So then, Vern, what would you say to someone who is wondering how text written thousands of years ago can still be relevant to their life today? Like they might say, well, well, that was great for the people of Israel or whatnot, but in my day to day, like we're in the middle of a pandemic and or maybe jobs may be hard to find. Like, how can God's word still be relevant? What would you say? Well, I, I think we must differentiate between what we sometimes call in biblical studies the event or the world of the event or the events about which it speaks. And on the other hand, 
what it is saying. So the message of the text. And, um, and, and I would suggest that we, we understand the word inspiration, uh, which mm. shows up only once in scripture in 2 oh. Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. But there are many other passages that, that uh, contribute to our understanding of scripture as inspired. The word itself means God breathed, that, that scripture mm -hmm. is the breath of God, the speaking breath of God. Mm -hmm. And I think too often we think of the word inspiration, which has been the teaching of Judaism and, and the Christian church all through the centuries, that scripture is inspired. It's the breath of God. Mm -hmm. Too often, I think we think of that solely in terms of its origin or how it came to be. Mm. And we put emphasis then on its accuracy, its, its historical accuracy, for example. And I mm -hmm. think that's a misunderstanding. It's mm -hmm. partially true, but we should think of inspiration as the breath of God. God is speaking, and God is speaking through these sacred words, not just to tell us, uh, or not just for the people at, at the level of the event in the ancient world, mm -hmm. but God mm -hmm. continues to speak through what the scriptures are saying about that event in the ancient world, or about that place, or about those people. Mm -hmm. And so what scripture is saying is as contemporary as, as, as today. Yeah. God is speaking this message today. So what we need to do is to be patient, attentive, prayerful readers and try to discern. And the church helps us a lot here. It's not that we're doing this as solo, you know, individual, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, but within the guidance of the church, we're trying to discern what is the spirit of God saying through this passage Mm -hmm. That though, yes, it addressed people long ago or describes events from, from centuries back, what it is saying is, is true today and alive mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and not to be careless or, or, or crass, but I like to tell my students that God doesn't have morning breath. His breath <laughs> is always this book is always fresh. Oh, um, I love that. <laughs> you know, and, and so if we if we view scripture that way, that it is speaking the message of God today, though about ancient times and places, people and so on, its yeah. message is is as living today as it was then. Yeah. And uh, so that's a start for this discussion. And uh, from there, of course, we could. Uh, give illustrations from all parts of scripture, um, but it's all the breath of God. And so yeah. we should be able to hear a message that God is speaking, whether from Genesis and the story of uh, Abraham, mm -hmm. and Joseph, or, or from uh, Ephesians and, and, and the message to the church and, uh, and all the other books as well. So yeah. That, that's a start to the conversation. That's a really important question. And I think a lot of people uh, are frustrated, not because the Bible is boring, but because we haven't learned how to read it well. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and so boredom isn't God's problem. It's our problem. <laughs> I agree. And, and we just need to learn to read and listen and pray better with it. Yeah. No, actually, I completely agree with you. Just this morning, I was just praying with the story of David and Goliath. Oh, and... yes. In the mass <laughs> readings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and just the, there's a particular line that David says where he says he's speaking to, I believe, Saul before he t turns to the Philistine and says, not by like human power am I going to kill you. <laughs> it's by yes. the strength of God. Yes. And I just, it made me just reflect on the situations in my life that might seem a little bit un unsurmountable. Yeah. And to just know, well, of course, like I'm not going to overcome those by my own strength, but by the strength and power of God. And his power is much greater than mine. And That's his correct. creativity is much <laughs> wider than mine. Yeah. And it was a call to just, trust and depend on the lord more instead of on myself that's right oh and, and i'm right with you i 
I am I'm part of a men's group. We meet okay. Wednesday mornings at 545 oh, for wow. mass. <laughs> okay. I've been up since 430 this morning. Oh. Um, and the reading I found profoundly moving for the very reason you just shared. Uh, we all have battles. And, and will we engage those battles just with our own human uh, worldly resources or will we trust God to go to battle for us? And yeah. that reading uh, from, from the familiar story of David and Goliath just mm -hmm. had a fresh relevance yes. to me this morning. Same here. That's illustrating what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. What, what God is saying there is as relevant today as it was in David's day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so speaking of other illustrations, are there specific verses or passages that have been guiding posts for you or just the source of encouragement for you in your life? Oh, so many of them. I, I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, from the early chapters of Genesis, we, we learn about who God is and mm -hmm. why we're here, to be mm -hmm. image bearers, to, to be those who reflect and who represent our Lord. Uh, from Exodus, uh, especially chapter three, I've been mm -hmm. I've been so drawn into that chapter. I've I've sometimes said that if I knew there was just one passage of scripture uh -huh. on which I could offer my last lecture or my uh -huh. last sermon, it would be Exodus three, where God oh. identifies Himself by name. Mm -hmm. um, from Leviticus, and I could walk through the whole Bible here, but from Leviticus, a, a not a popular book, many find mm -hmm. it boring and tedious, but we learn about the holiness of God and, mm -hmm. and how important every aspect of life is. Mm -hmm. And God wants to touch um, by his spirit every area of life to make it holy for him. Mm -hmm. The Deuteronomy passage we uh, pondered here a few minutes ago, um, you know, from the little story of Ruth, oh. we learn how God can use the ordinary and the everyday to accomplish great things. And, mm -hmm. and uh, let's never underestimate the, uh, the value God puts on, on our lives and our role in his uh, glorious work. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on First and Second Chronicles. I think many oh. Christians don't even remember that those books are in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, but, what is that uh, <laughs> those books have shaped me in many, many ways, uh, including um, they're part of my conversion story. I, I was oh. brought into the Catholic Church by way of my studies in Chronicles. Huh. Um, Book of Psalms, of course. Mm -hmm. That these psalms that take us into the pits, there are about 60 mm -hmm. of them or so that we call psalms of lament, these psalms of deep crying. Mm -hmm. Where are you, God? Uh, I'm yeah. hurting, my enemies are winning, and you don't seem to be <laughs> caring. <laughs> And, and then other psalms that take us onto the mountain peaks of praise, where we simply shout uh, and exclaim, how great thou art. Mm -hmm. um, Isaiah, Isaiah 40 through 48 have been go-to chapters for me in difficult times because of how they exalt God and, and help us to see that God is, is Lord of, of heaven and earth. In the New Testament, of course, the Gospels. I'm especially fond of the Gospel of John. Uh, mm -hmm. In my studies, I've probably spent most of my New Testament study time there. Okay. Um, Romans has shaped my understanding of Christian theology. Mm -hmm. Ephesians is probably my favorite New Testament book because of mm -hmm. how it uh, portrays the church and its role. Yeah. I love Philippians, not just because of the emphasis on, on joy, Mm -hmm. uh, which many people associate with Philippians, but because mm -hmm. of its emphasis on unity and, mm -hmm. and humility and how mm -hmm. God's people are to relate to one another. Mm -hmm. The little book of James has been mm -hmm. so influential. It's kind of the New Testament wisdom book, a little bit yeah. like Proverbs in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Revelation that wraps it all up, a challenging book to, yes. to read, but, uh, but a book that, uh, among other things, clearly communicates that, that God wins. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. and in, in the end, you know, God is victorious. And yeah. those who are on God's side will be victorious with him. Yeah. So yeah. what a glorious way to end the scriptures. So mm -hmm. 
those are, I mean, those are just a few of the of the highlight books for me, but I could yeah. probably walk through all 73 of them <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and point out how, how each has been influential uh, yeah. at different points in my life. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I, so similarly, I, I was intrigued when you mentioned Ruth. When I was a little girl, I, I just came from a very faithful family where um, scripture reading was very normal. Uh, with my mom just instilling that uh, in us and so i love the book of ruth and i actually learned the virtue of loyalty through reading about ruth yes and i just love the line where uh she says like where you go i will go your people will be my people your god will be my god and i just remember as a little girl just saying like i want to be that loyal <laughs> to the people in my life and and to god and and yeah i was just so inspired by that and then her love story which is really <laughs> sweet oh that that is so beautiful i teach entire courses on the book of ruth <laughs> oh okay i didn't know that <laughs> yeah when i taught in the seminary context uh, what we call hebrew exegesis so that's a, uh -huh. a course that follows on after a student has had a year of grammar oh, okay. and maybe a semester or two of just reading hebrew reading to build vocabulary and, and reinforce mm -hmm. grammar then we move into what we call exegesis where you slow down and you look at all the details in a mm. text you look at the grammar and the syntax and the context and all the rest uh -huh. ruth was my go-to book for a number of years for oh. that thesis class. so i'm i'm crazy in love with the book of ruth, <laughs> uh, yeah. for the reasons you mentioned and uh, mm. for others as well yeah oh well, that's just, great. This, just this little point you might find Please. interesting yeah um, mm -hmm. The Hebrew order of books is not uh -huh. quite the same as the English uh, sequence. Oh, okay. In the Hebrew Bible, Ruth immediately follows Proverbs. Oh. So it's at a completely different part of the yeah. canon. Yeah. What's interesting is that Proverbs ends with this poem uh, exalting the virtuous woman. Yes. Um, and the Hebrew expression used there is Ashet Chayel. Who can find an Ashet Chayel? An Ashet Chayel is a woman of virtue, a woman of mm. strong character, mm. uh, a, a woman of strength. And, and so in the Hebrew understanding of how books fit together, Ruth follows mm. Because she is an Ashet Chayel, and in wow. chapter three, Ruth, she is called such. Boaz refers to her mm -hmm. as an Ashet Chayel. Oh. And then when you look back at Proverbs 31 and observe what makes this woman such an Ashet Chayel, her loyalty, oh her, my gosh, love, yeah. her hard work, her self-sacrifice, mm. uh, and she is praised in the city gates. Look yeah. at the book of Ruth. It's oh like my saying, gosh. Oh, it's like wow. saying, give me an example, you know. Yeah. <laughs> she's hardworking, oh. she's sacrificial, she's loyal, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the one of the premier examples of loyalty in scripture. Yeah. She is um, she works hard for her family mm -hmm. and she's mm -hmm. praised in the city gates, Ruth yeah. chapter four. Yeah. So, uh, so it's just fitting that oh, Ruth wow. follows Proverbs thirty-one as an yeah. example. Yeah. Oh so I hope wow! <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Love for Ruth. It, it has. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Absolutely. Wow. Who thought we would get into this? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess God knew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. And so you also mentioned your love for the Psalms and that you do much of your teaching about the Psalms. So I guess why that book? Um, you mentioned the different like sure. books, uh, Psalms of Lament, Psalms of Praise, but, but why is that the one that you primarily focus on and what guidance can you provide for reading and interpreting and praying with it? Yes, it comes and goes. Um, for the last season, uh, the last two years or so, I, I've just happened to be in various settings where uh, uh, psalms seem to be fitting. I did a retreat for some of our religious sisters uh, on mm. psalms, okay. uh, taught, taught uh, elsewhere on psalms, uh, did a little series on the radio and psalms. Mm. So it's not that it, uh, over the years, has been my 
you know, number one go to, but, um, but in recent years, it seems okay. that I've happened there. And, and I mean, over the years, I've loved the book, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a few myths we have to get over. And sometimes I'll, I'll actually start a, a course with a, a little section on debunking some popular myths. Oh, uh, One of the myths about Psalms is that if you've read one, you've read them all, you know, they're oh, just, they're yeah. all alike. And that simply is not the case. Yeah. The opposite myth would be that they're all so dissimilar that there, mm -hmm. there are no common threads at all. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Another myth is that the book of Psalms is meant to be sung and prayed, but not studied and, and taught and learned, but that there really isn't um, content, substance. Mm -hmm. These are just uh, expressions of prayer and praise, and, and we're to leave it there, having mm -hmm. sung them or prayed them. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that's unfortunate. Um, yeah. Certainly in the rest of scripture, in the New Testament, for example, Psalms are referred to on par with the prophets and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and sometimes, uh, and the law as well. And so, so sometimes the New Testament authors draw really deep meaning and messages. Mm -hmm. from Psalms. So we just have to get over a few of these myths. But on a positive note, I encourage people to consider the book of Psalms as a thematic progression and, mm. and that's something that not a lot of christians i, I feel um have noted but through mm -hmm. the centuries that's been noted um mm. that the book of psalms actually isn't just a random collection you know a, 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 an assortment uh, you know an anthology it's actually thoughtfully put together. There's an introduction, mm. Psalms 1 and 2. There's a mm -hmm. conclusion, Psalms 146 through 150. And there are actually five books, a book 1, book 2, book 3, book 4, book mm -hmm. 5, within the book of Psalms, noted in most modern English versions. Mm. So what I encourage people to do is just slow down. There we go again, slow down. Yes. <laughs> and... Um, and try to pick up some thematic connections and, and points of progression. So, for example, mm -hmm. psalms of deep anguish and crying, lament psalms, tend to gather in the earlier part of the book. Hmm. And as we move past, oh, up into Psalm 90 and following, we have mm -hmm. many more expressions of exaltation and praise. Oh, that's true. Not either or, but, but there is an observable progression. Mm -hmm. Psalms of kingship, though introduced in Psalm 2, that theme picks up steam as we pass into Psalm 90 and following. Mm -hmm. um, we have three Torah psalms, psalms that focus mm -hmm. on the scriptures, Psalm 1, Psalm 19, and Psalm 119, the super psalm, the long one, the 176 <laughs> verses. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's striking to me. That after each of those Torah psalms, we have a psalm or a cluster of psalms noticeably, discernibly messianic. Uh -huh. As if to say, if we properly read the Torah, the scriptures, yeah. it will always point us to the Messiah. To wow. God. And um, so those are a few things. I would also encourage people to think of variety. I mentioned a moment ago, it's, it's a myth to think that they're all alike. No, the Psalms are a bit more like snowflakes, which scientists tell us no two are identical. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, and within the book of Psalms, we have a number of, of somewhat formal formal types. We've already mentioned the lament psalms. That's mm -hmm. the largest category, the psalms that cry deeply. Yeah. Uh, about 60 of the 150 psalms. But we have many psalms of praise that they're just exult exulting in, in their adoration of God. We have psalms of thanksgiving that focus on a particular answer to prayer, for example. We have psalms of confidence. You mentioned Psalm 23 earlier, the Lord is my shepherd, or 46 would be another one. God is our refuge and strength. And we have a cluster of psalms uh, not um, known widely by English readers that are structured on the Hebrew alphabet, where each verse, oh. each of the successive verses uh, uh -huh. take I should say each of the successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet takes its turn introducing the verses. And Psalm 119 is the most extravagant uh, example where each oh. Hebrew letter, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, 
Uh -huh. Each letter takes eight turns introducing, so the first eight verses all begin with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, all huh. of them. The oh, next wow. eight verses all begin with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Oh, so that's eight interesting. times 22 is 176. That's your number of verses in that psalm. Yeah. But what it does, it, it gives huh. it a beautiful artistry. It's breathtaking when, when we make that observation. Yeah. Uh, and there are a number of psalms structured that way. But my point basically is uh, the variety that we have. Mm -hmm. And we have variety of theme as well. We have creation psalms like mm -hmm. Psalm 8. Mm -hmm. We have uh, liturgical psalms like Psalm 15 that guide mm -hmm. us in terms of how we should approach our Lord uh, in worship. Mm -hmm. We have uh, enthronement psalms, psalms that, that lift up the Lord as king. Yeah. Uh, we have um, wisdom psalms that are instructive in their nature, like Psalm 1, the very first psalm. Mm -hmm. And so variety is a key. And, and I always, uh, and I think most of God's people know this, that we should read scripture prayerfully. So as mm -hmm. we read psalms, pray about it. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Let it, as we were saying earlier, let it inform your prayer life. Yeah. And carry on this this dialogical uh this conversation with our Lord. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean I, I hope my initial comment doesn't in any way imply that I'm not for singing and praying songs. Oh, no, 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 no. But as we slow down and study and observe a little bit. It, it, they just become all the richer. So mm -hmm. I, I love Psalms. Um, mm -hmm. it, it covers the whole range of human experience. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, it leads us into an honesty with our Lord when we yes. hear a psalmist cry out in words that we might have been hesitant because we, <laughs> we're, we're thinking maybe God will be offended if I'm honest. You know? uh, yeah. Psalms will just take us there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the language of God's people in their hymn, in their hymnology, in their prayer life, uh, in their daily life. Uh, mm -hmm. We are so blessed to have that book in sacred scripture. I absolutely yeah. love it. I, gosh, wholeheartedly agree with you. And just, again, thinking about the times that we're in right now and how the Psalms are truly the best uh, yeah. to pray with, because yeah. just like you said, the psalmist will say, like, Lord, out of, out of the depths, I cry out to you. Like, where are you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, like, it's very honest. And, yeah. and one thing that's been beautiful to see in some of the psalms is, so usually, like, it'll start off with this cry of lament. But then it's as if, like, in the process of getting it all out, then by the end of the psalm, it's a psalm of, of praise. Yeah. Like, it's just the recognition of, like, oh, you are still God. You are present. You are with me. That's right. And and what's interesting, Psalm 13 would be a, a parade case of what you just mentioned. It begins with a deep cry, a fourfold, how long, O Lord, how long? Mm -hmm. But it ends with praise. And we misinterpret those psalms mm -hmm. if, we, if we assume that the praise follows uh, on the, you know, the end of the bad experience. No, mm -hmm. it's praise in the midst of the pits. It's not yeah. praise just after the pit is behind yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. And I think often we, we, we misunderstand those psalms and if mm -hmm. we don't, if we don't see the context of that praise. Yeah. So the psalms lead us to understand that even in, in the times of darkness, uh, in those times when God seems to be silent, he is still worthy of praise. Yes. The problem isn't with God. The problem is with our view of God. Yeah. And this is why in Psalm 13, the psalmist prays that God will enlighten his eyes. Because he understands God isn't the problem here. The problem mm -hmm. is my vision. Yeah. I've lost sight of who God is, even in yeah. the valleys. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's so important to observe praise in the midst of the pits. Mm -hmm. and that's that's what we know from the saints as well. Yeah. And all, all the holy people of the past. Yeah. Uh, Oh Look gosh! Habakkuk, you know Habakkuk the prophet mm -hmm. at the end of that little three chapter book. Though though the, the vines aren't bearing their, their figs and the, the the sheep aren't in the stalls and the fields aren't producing, yet I will praise him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful yeah. uh, 
uh, example there. Yeah, and, and such a critical point. I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up because it, it goes back to the idea of, of love. Like, do we love God just because things yeah. are going well in our lives? Or do yeah. we love him because of, yeah, all the blessings that we're receiving? Or do we love him because of who he is, despite okay. whatever is happening? And, and then if that's the case, then that actually is true love. Like, th despite if, yeah, the vines are dying or <laughs> yeah. we can't necessarily see the end in sight, but he is still good, like, exactly. regardless. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Psalm 136. There are 26 verses to that psalm. The second line in all 26 verses is identical. Hmm. For his loyal love is probably the best translation. For his loyal love is forever. For mm -hmm. his loyal love is forever. 26 times hmm. we're being reminded that even though experience uh, circumstances might not all seem favorable and, and mm. happy yeah god's loyal love is forever he doesn't forsake us even in the valleys even in, in the pits as i call them the yeah. pits and the peaks in song yeah. Yeah. yeah even in the pits god is still loyal in his love and uh and we know the end of the story for god's people that there will come a day of, of triumph mm -hmm, that might mm -hmm. not be immediate. And yeah. uh, so we, we cling in faith to his loyal love. Yes. Yes. Amen. <laughs> so speaking of the Psalms or just anywhere in scripture, and this is a pretty specific question, but oftentimes in my work as a career coach and working and walking alongside different women, um, there are many who are just searching for their call in, their vocation, the thing that God has put on their heart to do. And so just in your studies of scripture, are there key verses that you would recommend that, um, that women or men can just lean on and just, or specific stories to, to just discern, um, just what God might be calling them to and how to, to journey along that? That's a wonderful question. Um, and, and a number of passages do come to mind, some okay. of which I've already mentioned. Um, there is a reason why Genesis early chapters are where they are in the mm. Bible. Okay. And not just because creation comes first, but because what we should first know about our God is that God is the creator which means all things belong to to him it also emphasizes that god spoke creation into existence it does not report that god decided once upon a time to make everything and so he did but god said let there be god said let there be mm -hmm. and right at the high point of creation god creates man and woman in his image Mm -hmm. Unlike anything else God has made, humans are created in God's image. And let's understand that. We could be more technical about it, but let's understand that basically. We are placed in God's wonderful creation, beautiful, orderly, operating creation where all the systems work. We are placed there to represent and to reflect our Lord. Yeah. And and that becomes then a, a guiding, I think, for I think for for how we should um, consider this matter of God's will for my life. Mm -hmm. Before everything else, I am called, I'm invited into God's world mm. to be a, a representative and a reflector and an agent of new creation, because we all know what follows. Creation mm -hmm. is in the fall mm -hmm. we're called here to be agents of new creation mm. serving god's new creation purposes which is how the story ends the last chapters of revelation echo the first chapters of genesis mm -hmm. so the whole story of scripture is moving from creation to new creation how can i be an agent there well beginning to think about that from the first three chapters of genesis is fundamental it seems to me yeah. And among other things, it ought lead us to to this point that it, it 
I think I think it'll be clear if I put it this way. It's more important that I be the right person mm. than that I be in the right position. Um, I don't want to create either ors, but even in marriage, I, I think, and, and take it from somebody who just celebrated 50 anniversary, um, it's more important that I be the right person than yeah. that I find the right person. Yeah. And the emphasis here being that if I am becoming who God wants me to be, yeah. God will direct my steps to be functioning in, in the positions and the roles and the marriage and all the rest that he wants mm -hmm. me. So it's a matter of focus. And, and, yeah. and then if I could go uh, just a step further, yes, there are specific passages. So for example, uh, Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six, probably the most uh, well-known verses from that great mm -hmm. book of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart mm -hmm. and do not lean on your own understanding. Mm -hmm. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And then watch the translation here. He will make sure you're on the right path. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Yeah. But I think that is the idea, that if we trust God mm -hmm. with all our heart and, and don't lean on our own human you know, understanding, mm -hmm. but acknowledge him, know him uh, in every step of life, seek to know God in the mm -hmm. presence of this situation or this, yeah. this state of life, then he will make sure we're on the right path. He, he will guide us in his will. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I, I would move further into a passage like Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, where mm -hmm. Jesus lays out the kind of character that he wants for his kingdom citizens. Once again, emphasis being on who I am as a person. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe more important than which place I live in or which position I fill. Mm -hmm. Am I becoming this person God wants me to be becoming? Yeah. Yeah. Am I becoming an agent of new creation, serving his glorious purposes? Am I becoming like Jesus wants his kingdom citizens to be? Mm -hmm. um, Romans 12, 1 and 2 have been guiding verses. Um, therefore, um, in light of God's mercies, uh, present your bodies as living sacrifices to God. So th this brings up the theme then of yieldedness, dedication, of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of uh, uh, um, consecration of all of life. And it goes on uh, and expands on that. So these would be, be a few passages, but I cannot overemphasize getting off on the right foot <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. genesis one through three and uh, an understanding of who god is uh, how we are called to be uh, uh, members of his uh, wonderful creation uh, contributing to god's purposes mm -hmm, and becoming mm -hmm. the people god wants us to be in the midst of all of that so yeah. that uh, doesn't cover the topic but I, I perhaps could capsulize it by saying god cares more about who we are than than we do <laughs> yeah and, and maybe god cares more about who we are than even you know exactly i'm, I'm sort of repeating but where we live or or what we do in terms of uh, vocational uh, mm -hmm. things. Um, let's just focus on being God's holy people. Yeah. And, and loving God with all we are and all we have. Yeah. And I think uh, with that sort of yieldedness, God will often take care of the particulars. So yeah. I'm not trying to sidestep this. No, but, no. Uh, just as a point of emphasis. And I'm truly glad that you said that. So... Uh, early last year, I so I, I actually never get sick. <laughs> I had really good, <laughs> um, um, but anyways, I was in bed sick last year. It wasn't COVID. It was just like a really bad cold, mm -hmm. and I was laying in bed and I was really frustrated because I'm very much a doer and I'm always doing something. And mm -hmm. so to be in bed, it was just really <laughs> it was really hard for me. 
but I was like, okay, fine, God, I'll just stay here and rest <laughs> and pray. <laughs> uh -huh. And so I, I was just praying about just how frustrated I was about just not being able to do anything. And I just felt, just got a sense of just our Lord just asking me the question of, when you think of a, a little child, do they do anything? Mm -hmm. I was like, no, they just play, they talk, they just <laughs> live their lives. They just like, be. They just yeah. be. He's like, well, and I still love them. I'm like, okay. He's like, well, what about a baby? Does a baby do anything? I was like, no, like it literally can't do anything on its own. Like it, it just is. He's like, and I still love them. He said, okay, what about somebody um, that's retired or in a uh, retirement facility and they're just sitting on a chair dozing off? Um, are they doing anything? I'm like, no. He's like, well, they still have value and I still love them. And so you lying in bed, spending this time with me, I still love you, regardless if you're doing anything for me or not. Like, I just want your heart. And it just, it actually brought me to tears just thinking that, yeah, like I focus so much on my productivity. I put a lot of value in my work, but really and truly at the end of the day, God just loves me and loves to just be with me and he's like you said more concerned about who i am than than what i have on my resume or the the work that i spend my time yeah. doing we just have to recalibrate you know re uh, measure by different criteria what, yes. what is ultimately valuable and our mm -hmm. greatest value uh, or or um criterion of value lies in the fact that we're created in the image of god that's who we are yeah that's fundamental identity we are image bearers yeah. now uh, are there things we're called to do yes yes, yes. yes. but let's not get those uh, you know misaligned mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, i think of a couple of passages uh, joshua 1 verse 8 and it's very similar language, uh, an echo of it in Psalm 1, verse 3, where God measures success through prosperity mm -hmm. more by uh, obedience and um, uh, loving and, and meditating upon his word than by all the things we can check off, you know, as, yeah. as accomplishments. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, talks about in Psalms, it talks, of course, about the tree planted by rivers and streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and all that it, and it, it, its leaf doesn't wither, and I'm forgetting it now, and all that he does, he prospers. Well, prosperity there cannot be measured by the, the world's criteria of prosperity. It's measured mm -hmm. by, am I like this tree that's planted by God's planting? Yeah. By his river of, of living water, am I being nourished by the Lord? Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, his fruit is being born in my life, uh, even if I will not be um, measured you know, as successful in the eyes of the world. So mm -hmm. that, that whole cluster of ideas, I think, is so important for God's people to. Yeah. Remember. I 100% agree with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And just. I was, as you were speaking, I was reflecting on my life and the moments where I have been more focused on who God is and who I am in him. I just feel more grounded. Like I feel like that tree that's, that's well rooted and balanced versus um, in other situations where I've been seeking other people's approval or seeking the approval of what the word considers to be successful and just how just unbalanced I felt. And I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm so grateful for verses like that that just remind me of the truth that like this is this is how God sees me and how what he desires for me and for all of us to be be rooted and grounded in him so that he can fill and renew us. Exactly. Yeah, so well put. Oh, thank you. So we are coming close to our time, Vern, and I just have a just a couple more questions for you. I feel like we've already touched on this next one I'm going to ask you quite a bit, but just for someone wanting to just start, maybe they used to be in a habit of reading scripture, or maybe they never, they didn't grow up in a family where that was normal. 
Uh, where do you recommend beginning to, yeah, to enter into God's word? And uh, beginning with Genesis and reading Exodus, then moving to the Gospels and reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with, with a definite focus to get to know Jesus better as the fulfillment of everything that you would have read had you read the entire Old Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment, the embodiment of all of that. But Jesus uh, came, um, Jesus established the church and has called us to be the church. What does that look like? And how does the church behave in this world? Book of Acts will get us uh, moving uh, in, into that. And uh, then, of course, all the letters that follow are instructions um, for the life um, of the church. Um, so Genesis, Exodus, and then the Gospels and Acts, I think, would be a wonderful place for people to begin. I, I realize that's a lot of material, but back to earlier thoughts, what's the hurry? <laughs> what's <laughs> that's the true. Hurry? If, if that's our true. goal is to get to know our God and to get to know who we are in yeah. his wonderful plan, what's the hurry? So patiently uh, read those books, and, and then, of course, read all of it, uh, but uh, those would be starter places I would oh. recommend. Oh, wonderful. Vern, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and for like and renewing and inspiring us to spend time in scripture. And like you said, to, to not be in a hurry, to truly listen to our Lord and to hear the words that he has to say for us mm -hmm. and to be witnesses to to his message to the world. So, so Vern, if someone wanted to learn more and to take more, to take classes from you or from others at the Institute, where would they go? Sure, the best place to go would be to our website. It's www.emmaus, that's spelled E-M-M-A-U-S, emmausinstitute.net. And uh, everything we offer will be posted there. Do keep in mind that we're still in our infancy. We're just developing our program. But um, that would be the best place to go to get information. And then, of course, you could always request to be on our mailing list, uh, an email type subscription. Uh, you can uh, unsubscribe anytime. We try not to overfill your inbox. But uh, that would also be a way to get uh, the latest information. Great. Wonderful. Well, Vern, would you mind closing this out in prayer? Absolutely. Let's pray together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, we humbly bow before you, acknowledging that you are God and we are not. You've called us to live in your world uh, for glorious purposes and according to your will. And uh, we pray that uh, this uh, conversation here today will serve those ends among your people who are able to view, and uh, that all of us will be drawn deeper in our love for you, our, our worship of you, our desire to know you uh, more intimately, and to walk with you more faithfully. I pray, dear Lord, for your blessing upon Valentina and her ministry, and I pray that it will reach many people and encourage their, their walk with you. Thank you for the gift of this time together. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for Jesus, your son. And we pray all these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you, Vern. You're welcome. Thank you, too. What a privilege. It's, oh. it's wonderful getting to know you a bit better. And, yes. And I, and I hope this uh, serves your, your ministry well. Oh. And uh, if uh, you need anything further from me, you know how to get a hold of me. All right. Thank you, Vern. And Absolutely. thank you for everyone listening. And God bless you and see you next time. Right. Bye. Bye-bye.